All right, it seems like uh, people entering are starting to taper off. So uh, I'll say whenever you're ready, Kyle. All righty, thanks, Nathan. So I will go ahead and share here. All right, so I'm talking about fission uh, and specifically the formation of fission fragments. So Nathan will handle everything that happens after we get those fragments and all the, all the fun stuff that uh, boils off of them. Um, so fission, uh, kind of, I'm going to break it up into a couple different steps here from the deformation of a uh, excited nucleus to going through a, what we call saddle points on the potential energy surface to the scission where the two fragments actually break up and what happens to those fragments we'll leave for, uh, for Nathan tomorrow. So first, a little bit of background. Uh, fission was discovered uh, by Lee Meitner, Otto Hahn, and Fritz Straussman back in uh, 1938 by bombarding uranium-235 with thermal neutrons. And they discovered, wow, a lot of stuff came out. Um, and what actually happened is that the incident neutron excited this uranium-235 uh, nucleus, and it became excited and it became highly asymmetric, it uh, deformed, and then eventually broke into two pieces. And those two pieces boiled off some neutrons and photons. And this deformation and this uh, rupture, which we call scission, is primarily driven by Coulomb repulsion, by the fact that there's, uh, you know, there's essentially too much charge uh, being held in these uh, in these systems, and then there's also other competing effects or other um, maybe I should say uh, corrective you know smaller corrective effects. Um, fission is a fairly hot topic of study. If you type it into Google Scholar, you'll see over a million results. And the reasons we are, we're interested in studying fission, um, of course, nuclear energy. Um, various natural security, nuclear non-proliferation. Um, actually, there's um, there's uh, fission shows up in astrophysics and nuclear astrophysics in some capacity. And I think even more interestingly, it relates to fundamental questions about um, where do nuclei come from? Uh, essentially, in in the universe, how are heavy nuclei formed? Um, and how do the fundamental interactions of the strong force, uh, quantum chromodynamics, how does this give rise to complex nuclear structures? And uh, I think these slides will be available to you guys. So these are all clickable links here, the sources I use for this talk. So if you, uh, you know, want more information, those are great places to start. So personally, why do I think fission is interesting? Um, because it's, there's a really a lot going on. There's not kind of one simple mental model that explains everything. So it's, it's still sort of a, you know, there's, there's lots of open questions. Uh, it's interesting in that the process of scission from the nucleus being excited and breaking up and then eventually decaying and the fragments becoming stable happens over, you know, many, many disparate time scales. So there's a lot of different effects going on uh, in succession. And I think most interestingly is this is an example of a many body quantum system, but not an infinitely many. So we can apply some statistical arguments, but we have to be very careful because the amount of nucleons in our, you know, in our nucleus is on the order of, you know, 200 or so. And I've put uh, on some of these slides, I've put a picture of a physicist um, for where I think a point is just especially interesting to me. Um, so, you know, if you pay attention, uh, you know, pay attention to the slides that have physicists on them. And here's an example of physicist. Um, and I also wanna say, if you have questions, uh, feel free to interrupt, uh, raise your hand, put them in the chat. Uh, and Nathan, if you're, if you're monitoring the chat uh, and the questions, feel free to like stop me. And um, you know, if there's a good question, let me know. All right, so thanks. So first I'm gonna start off with some, some fun facts, essentially, just a couple sort of, here's the things that we observe when we see fission. So first, why well, I talked about you know long disparate time scales. So first, from the uh, essentially the formation of uh, the, what we see the process of these two nuclei breaking apart, the process from saddle, so from sort of a 
T-formed elongated nucleus to breaking into two pieces happens on the order of 10 to the minus 21 seconds. Um, and then prompt neutrons and gammas are boiled off from 10 to the minus 18 to the 10 to the minus three seconds. And then the fragments that remain are uh, unstable against beta decay. And that can cause um, beta particles and delayed neutrons and gammas, you know, off for many, many years after the initial fission occurred. So this is what I mean when I say there's, there's long time scales. Uh, the energy that you release in fission is just a function of, you know, what was the mass of the initial uh, nucleus? And then what were the masses of the, you know, the two final fragments? And then, you know, if the fission is induced by a neutron, you also have that incident neutron energy and then mass of the neutron that adds to the initial energy budget, essentially, of the system. And this liberated energy is divided between kinetic energy of the two fragments that come out, which we call TKE. So this is the total kinetic energy of the two fragments that are produced. Um, so they're going to be zipping off at high speeds, you know, after after they rupture, after they you know scission occurs. And then also some of that energy will go into the excitation energy, the intrinsic energy within those fragments. So those fragments are not going to be static objects; they're going to be excited. You can think of them like you know hot liquids filled with uh, neutrons and protons. And um, you know, like I said, Nathan will tell us tomorrow what happens to all that excitation energy. So just to put some numbers to it for uranium-235, neutron induced thermal neutron-induced fission, we might have a liberated energy of around 195 MeV. Most of that, around 170 MeV, will be in the kinetic energy of the fragments. Um, so, you know, say in a nuclear reactor, as those fragments move and slow down in the material, that causes the material to heat up. And that's how a nuclear reactor works. That heat, you know, we use to boil water and, and you know, power our laptops and uh, rice cookers and all that. And then the rest of that energy goes to the uh, excitation energy intrinsic to the fragments after scission happens. So what properties do these fragments have? So here we have a chart of isotopes, you know, more neutrons uh, horizontally, more protons vertically. And the colors, you know, the, the more red tells you the more likely that a specific isotope is going to be produced in the spontaneous fission of Californium-252. So we can see we sort of have these two uh, regions here. So a heavier fragment up here. Uh, can you guys see my, you can see my mouse, right? Nathan? Uh, we'll get around again. Yes, we can see your cursor. Okay, cool. I'm just, I use it to gesture a lot, so just wanted to confirm. Yeah, but we can see essentially two blobs, right, for the heavy and for the light fragments. And uh, if we look at, say, just fragment mass, so this figure in the upper right here, you know, we see there's two peaks, right? This, there's a, uh, you know, there's fission happens sort of asymmetrically. Um, this is something, you know, we can, uh, we have observed many, many times. And, you know, again, we see something similar for uh, fragment charge, although I will say fragment charge is a lot more complicated um, than just the fragment mass yields. Um, and another thing I want to mention that I don't actually have on this slide is that, so this picture of uh, fragment mass yields is for spontaneous fission of California 252. For induced fission, uh, especially for fission uh, uh, that's induced by really energetic neutrons, you can have a very, very excited target uh, uh, nucleus, and that can cause uh, the ability to have symmetric fission. So you'll see this, um, this uh, mass yield will become more symmetric for high incident energy uh, induced fission. So some more fun facts, um, and this one is, is quite interesting, is that there is some dependence of, uh, of the kinetic energy that the two fragments have on which mass numbers are produced, right? So we see that kinetic energy sort of peaks around this uh, mass 130 region, right? And as we become more and more asymmetric in fission, so as the heavy fragment gets more and more massive, we have less energy that goes towards kinetic energy, right? Which implies that potentially less or more energy right, has to go towards that intrinsic excitation energy. So there's something we can sort of learn from this, right? There must be more excitation, excitation energy available 
in asymmetric fission than there is in symmetric fission over here. And there's, there must be something special, special about this, this mass number of 130. And uh, maybe going back to this slide, a little bit of a spoiler, these bars here refer to shell closures in, you know, in the number of neutrons and the number of protons, um, meaning where, where shells become filled and where nuclei become approximately spherical. So think about that in the context of this, and we'll come back to this later and try to answer it more. So the goal for the rest of this talk is, can we come up with a sort of a simple mental model that explains these fun facts that I've just, uh, that I've just showed you? And to do that, to try to come up with a simple mental model, we have to take a couple steps towards learning to think like a nuclear physicist. And one thing nuclear physicists think about a lot is the concept of scale and that the resolution scale with which you observe a system determines the relevant degrees of freedom that you can use to describe that system. So let's take a brick, for example. On a macroscopic scale, if we have a brick, this brick has something like 10 to the 24 atoms, but those are not relevant degrees of freedom on a macroscopic scale. But when you hold a brick in your hand, really the degrees of freedom are you can translate it and you can rotate it, it has six degrees of freedom. And it's only when you zoom in by maybe shining an X-ray or something at the brick, and that X-ray is a very small wavelength, and therefore you're probing much smaller length scales. And the, at, at those length scales, the degrees of freedom will be different. So here's a fun picture uh, of a cow that uh, explains that. That you know, as the as you change the length scale of your probe, uh, you're able to resolve different degrees of freedom in a system under study. Um, and typically the length scale of our probe is a wavelength. So this is Louis de Broglie, and this is the de Broglie wavelength. Um, and as an aside, uh, Louis de Broglie, in, in my high school chemistry teacher, he had a poster of Louis de Broglie on, his, uh, on the wall and he made us bow down to him and say, Louis de Broglie, Louis de Broglie. And uh, I think we should all you know, take, take some time and appreciate Louis de Broglie. So here's, uh, here's Weinberg, who sort of really formalized this idea in, uh, in nuclear physics by you know, sort of creating a framework for how we understand that the degrees of freedom at high energy, so quarks and gluons, then gives rise to the degrees of freedom we see in nuclei between neutrons and protons. So this is you know, this, the same idea of scale now applied to nuclear physics at around a GeV or higher, for example, like in the Large Hadron Collider in Switzerland, the relevant degrees of freedom of nuclear matter are quarks and gluons. And as we cool down, as we you know, decrease that energy and increase the length scale, our relevant degrees of freedom become, um, become baryons, become hadrons. So these are uh, neutrons and protons. And the pions and, and other... Uh, of other composite particles that they exchange um, as sort of effective force carriers. As we decrease the energy even further, we get protons and neutrons in aggregate within a nucleus. And then even further still, we can then treat these protons and neutrons sort of as collective uh, fluids essentially. And, and even further, we can sort of have very simple uh, descriptions of you know, a solid object essentially rotating. Um, so fission sort of lives down here in energy scale. Uh, fission, the, the primarily energy scale is that is in, in where collective behavior in nuclei exists. So things like rotations, vibrations, and stretching, these are sort of the dominant degrees of freedom. Um, essentially we can treat a fissioning nucleus like neutron and proton fluids. The degrees of freedom are not individual neutrons and protons, but rather the density of the nuclear fluid, the size of the nuclear fluid um, and things like that. And then we will see as we go forward in this, in this talk, how, uh, how interactions at higher resolution scales, so up here uh, with protons and neutrons and with baryons and mesons actually create small corrections on this collective description. So higher length scales, or sorry, smaller length scales will give you small corrections to a good description at a larger length scale. Kyle, we um, have a question in chat. 
Yes. And it's the following. It says, uh, how do you explain a fissile nucleus and a non-fissile nucleus? Uh, is it the particularity? It, it, what is the particularity of a fissile nucleus? Yeah, that's a good question. Particularity, could you maybe elaborate on what particularity means? Uh, I'm not sure about that, but can you just tell us what makes a nucleus fissile versus non-fissile? Right, so what makes a nucleus fissile, and by the way, fissile, uh, for those who don't know, means that a nucleus, if bombarded with a uh, thermal neutron, it will uh, you know, have some high probability of undergoing fission. And what makes a nucleus fissile is that the, you know, the nucleus plus a neutron um, will be in an excited state that is apt to be highly deformed. And these high, you know, these, these high degree of deformations will then drive this you know, sort of runaway reaction where it splits into two. And typically we see this in heavy nuclei on the order of mass numbers of like 200 or more. Um, and we see this in neutron rich nuclei. And we'll get a little bit more detail uh, as the talk goes on. So getting back to sort of the idea of we can treat our nuclear, uh, our, our nucleons as sort of a collective nuclear matter. Um, so this idea is called the liquid drop model, which I think you've heard at least in, I think in previous talks um, in this uh, summer school. And if you add in some corrections that arise from sort of, you know, smaller length scales, you get what's called the finite, finite range droplet model, which we'll see has some interesting predictions about fission. So that was scale. Now let's think about, think like a nuclear physicist about the saturation of nuclear matter. So here on the left, we have a picture of, you know, a sort of a example of a uh, force between two nucleons, say between two neutrons. Right, and we have sort of this hard core um, where at very short length scales, these things are very repulsive. Um, and then we have what looks like, you know, sort of this little um, equilibrium point here where um, sort of if two nucleons are going to be put next to each other, they wanna be in this sort of low energy region and far away, you know, they sort of don't feel each other. And um, we can see that, you know, there are, uh, going back to the baryons and mesons, right? There are exchanges of, uh, of force carrying particles here that explain sort of different length scales of this force, right? But the result of this is that because we have this sort of characteristic shape where nuclei sort of want to be in, you know, at a certain distance from each other and not, more, not much more, not much less, we see what's called the incompressibility or saturation uh, density of nuclear matter where all nuclei, no matter sort of how heavy they are, how many, um, you know, how much, how many nucleons they have, they sort of have the same uh, density profile where the radius sort of scales with uh, the mass number, the number of nucleons to the power of one third. And they all sort of have this, um, you know, sort of soft uh, decrease in density at the edges. They're a little bit fluffy uh, or fuzzy at the edges, all right? So this is a great example of how these, uh, these interactions that arise at small length scales give rise to properties that occur at low or at, at longer length scales, right? So um, we can essentially treat nuclei almost like a liquid, right? This looks a lot like the interaction between molecules and a liquid being that, you know, there's an equilibrium distance that they want to sit in. Um, and this causes nuclear matter to be sort of an incompressible fluid. So another thing we should consider, um, do nuclei have memory? And here's a nice picture of Niels Bohr, who back in 1936, essentially described that um, nuclear reactions, some nuclear reactions happen uh, where the incident neutron is absorbed, a compound system is formed, and this system lives a, you know, a, on a much longer time scale than the time scale of the initial absorption. So the absorption happens and then you get this compound system that lives for a while, you know, it equilibriates, it forgets where the neutron came in, and then eventually that decays into, you know, whatever it decays into. So this is the idea of it, the compound nucleus that Niels Bohr proposed. And we see that uh, 
you know, there's absolutely, you know, compound nuclear components in a lot of nuclear reactions. So uh, I want to, I guess, just make the point that compound nucleus reactions have no memory, uh, meaning that, say, you know, your incident neutron hits your nucleus, that energy, you know, you, you immediately have this really excited thing, and then that energy sort of equilibriates and it gets dispersed uh, somewhat evenly between the constituent nucleons of the nucleus. You can think of it like uh, you hit the nucleus and the nucleus gets hot as a result because you've added that energy and it just gets hot. Um, and then there's also other types of nuclear reactions I should mention. So there are direct reactions where there is sort of a memory where, you know, at smaller length scales, instead of probing the whole nucleus, you probe a single nucleon in that nucleus typically and interact with just that. Um, so direct reactions are sort of the nuclear reactions that have memory. And then in the middle, we have weird stuff that we don't have to get into. And fission is a compound process. So fission um, is a process in which that initial excitation energy that's delivered by um, either a random fluctuation in the case of spontaneous fission or by um, incident neutron is equilibriated into a collective deformation energy that causes, you know, you know the the um, descent into this this splitting shape, this dumbbell shape that eventually ruptures. Um, and then getting back into the point where you know what makes a a, a nuclei fissile, um, and one of the main uh, one of the main things is that the sort of branching ratios for fission. Are, are large, meaning that the compound nucleus will preferentially de-excite through fission versus de-excite through other pathways. So other pathways might be emitting a neutron or emitting a gamma or something like that, or emitting an alpha particle. Um, so fissile neutrons, because of the sort of intrinsic uh, shape and, um, and constituents of the excited states that are formed uh, in the compound nucleus, preferentially de-excite through fission. And, um, and essentially what that means is that these, uh, these resonances, these virtual states of the compound nucleus that are formed are going to be highly deformed, meaning they're going to be amenable to causing that sort of runaway uh, reaction of fission. So we've talked about um, these excited compound states must be deformed. What does that actually look like? Um, so we all kind of know about, right, potential energy diagrams, right? So if you think of, uh, instead of looking at deformation, imagine this is just, you know, the x-axis, this is just distance, then this is a hill, right? And you have, to, if you start here, let's say this, say this is your ground state, you have to climb up, so you have to lose some energy. And then once you get here, at the subtle point, you can roll down and you get a lot of energy back. So this diagram is that same idea, but instead of, you know, distance, uh, on the x-axis, we have deformation. So this is, think of our nuclei almost like an elastic band. As you stretch it, you get more energy. Um, with the addendum that initially you have to add some energy to stretch, but eventually, almost like the breaking of an elastic band, you get a lot of energy back uh, once it passes the saddle point. Um, and you know, here we have you know sort of just some. Uh, examples of what this compound nucleus might look like. Um, so here, the ground state before excitation by an incident neutron. Um, here, sort of a dumbbell at the saddle point. And then down here at scission, these uh, two fragments become fully separated. And you can see the time scales um, for this. You know, Once we start at the saddle and go down to scission uh, are quite uh, faster, or, or much, much, much faster than the time it takes to uh, evolve and equilibrate from the ground state to the saddle. So sort of this area, this region is the slow statistical equilibration of you know, that incident nuclear, incident neutrons energy um, into this deformed state. And then once you pass this, it's just a runaway train and very, very fast. So finite range droplet model. Let's take a look at one of the ways in which we can understand um, how this deformation happens. Here's a lot of equations, don't look at them. So the finite range droplet model essentially gives us an idea of, um, we, we have sort of a, the 
uh, macroscopic idea of we treat our nucleus as a liquid drop and we can understand we have this incompressible sort of fluid and as we change its shape, we can change its energy. It's all very classical, it's all very macroscopic. And then we add small corrections due to quantum effects that arise in, in nuclear physics due to shell effects and due to pairing effects. So these examples are just examples of, you know, energy as a function of deformation. And we see that um, the sort of macroscopic liquid drop uh, contribution are these nice smooth uh, dashed lines. And then when we add shell and pairing corrections, things get wiggly and weird. And we're not gonna get too far into the details, but I just want to um, just give you an, a general idea of what I mean when I say shell and pairing corrections. So for shell effects, remember, we have these shell closures, um, just like how stable um, like neon gas or argon gas, the noble gases are because they have a full shell of electrons. You have the same situation uh, in nuclei where you, once you fill a full shell of neutrons or protons or even better neutrons and protons, you get what these, you know, we, we call these magic numbers or shell closures where you get very stable nuclei. So um, when we think about this deformation, right, the deformation to some extent will determine the, you know, how much mass each fragment has because that deformation, you know, eventually, um, you know, how much mass is here and how much mass is here will eventually lead to, you know, how much mass is in the individual fragments. So there is some preference, right, for the fragments to have, um, you know, to be more stable, right, to, uh, to be near one of these shell closures. And we'll see how that comes up later. Um, and one sort of uh, addendum we have to add to this is that the, uh, the shell closures for a, you know, for the change essentially, the, the, the energy levels change as we deform this nucleus. So uh, I guess without getting too much into the details, um, we see like, here's, you know, an example set of energy levels um, for, you know, sort of this ellipsoidal nucleus. And then as we start stretching into a dumbbell shape, we can see that our energy levels change. So it becomes sort of uh, quite complicated to include these, uh, these shell corrections. And then I also wanna mention um, these pairing corrections. So if you've heard of the idea of superconductors, um, you know, in electromagnetic superconducting materials, things that if you, you know, you cool down, you dip into liquid nitrogen, and then you uh, plug them up to a battery and you see that the current passes through them with essentially zero resistance. So the way that works is you have two electrons. Electrons are fermions and fermions must obey Fermi statistics where they, you know, if there's a fermion in the ground state, uh, the next fermion, you know, has to be in a slightly different state, right? So fermions cannot occupy the same, uh, you know, the same, the same state at the same time, whereas bosons can. So what happens in superconductors is two electrons, uh, you know, form together into these little pairs, and you can treat this pair as a boson, a bosonic quasi-particle, we say, and uh, and now they can all condense right to the ground state, and you know they sort of act like this this fluid. And this is what's what BCS theory, barton cooper schreifer theory describes. And it turns out we have the same thing in nuclei that there's. Um, there's a, a large amount of uh, energy you get from, um, you know, pairing your neutrons and protons. So essentially meaning that odd, uh, odd uh, nu nuclei with an odd number of neutrons or an odd number of protons are less stable. They have, you know, uh, uh, more e uh, energy than uh, their counterparts with even numbers. Um, and of course, this all happens at a finite temperature, right? This is not um, what I've given you is sort of idealized shell and pairing corrections, but um, it, it, realistically, you know, just like if you take that superconductor that you dipped in liquid nitrogen and stick it at room temperature, that um, that uh, BCS, you know, these these Cooper pairs are are going to break apart and act more like individual electrons because the average kinetic energy of the system, the temperature is going to be larger than the scale of the interactions uh, and the uh, sort of the degeneracy pressure that causes these effects. So you have to uh, be very careful by incorporating these shell and pairing 
corrections with, uh, you know, in a finite temperature for formalism, essentially. Um, so including essentially some viscosity is the way that's done in the finite range droplet model. So another, um, another idea we can do is instead of doing this sort of macroscopic, microscopic approach where we take our, you know, our liquid droplet model and then add a quantum uh, corrections, we can also start from sort of a fully microscopic approach uh, called mean field theory. And I'm not going to get too much into the, into the concept, but essentially um, there's these guys, Cohn and Sham, that came up with equations where, you know, a formulation of quantum mechanics in terms of the probability density instead of the wave functions. And then these guys, Hartree and Fock, applied this to quantum many body systems. And the idea is that you have your wave functions, you calculate a density, and then you come up with a functional for a potential that is a fun it takes in a, the density function and returns a, a value. So meaning that you construct this density and each uh, particle essentially in your system does not feel individual correlations with every other particle, but rather feels the mean field introduced by the density of all the other particles in the system. And by like solving these equations iteratively, iteratively you get what's called a self-consistent mean field theory. And um, this basic idea can be applied to um, understanding the deformation in fission. It can be described understanding, um, you know, how we evolve from the ground state to the saddle. It can be under, uh, applied to understand even the dynamics of how we evolve from the saddle decision. Um, and this is, you know, produced some, some interesting work in recent years. So let's take again a look at, you know, this idea of a potential energy surface. So now we have two sort of coordinates, um, two sort of independent variables. One is this, this Q20, which tells us how stretched our dumbbell is, you know, how long it gets, how, how much it elongates. Then Q30 tells us sort of about the mass asymmetry that we end up with in our, in our post-scission uh, fragments. And here's a potential energy surface for plutonium-240 uh, calculated with, this, with a mean field theory. And there's some features we can notice. So one, there's these valleys, right? There's these sort of low energy, like quasi-stable systems or shapes that the system must pass through on the way to uh, on the way to scission. So if we start sort of in our ground state here, we have to pass through, you know, this potentially longer lived um, uh, quasi-stable shape. And then we also have these saddles, which are energy barriers the system must pass through on the way to scission. Um, and we can see those actually in this in this case and Quite commonly, there's two different uh, energy saddles, so two different shapes that you have to have enough energy to create, or you quantum mechanically tunnel through those barriers to be able to get onto this side um, where fission or where scission happens, where sort of you know we get this runaway reaction. And another point to make is that you know how much energy you have initially uh, determines what the what the your you know your eventual path through this potential energy surfaces or across the surfaces. So if you start down here in the ground state, uh, you know, for example, and then, um, you, you know, you have to tunnel through and then this saddle and you have to tunnel through this saddle and, it, you know, it might be very unlikely to even make it here. But if you do, you're probably going to follow this least action path. Um, whereas if you have a very high incident energy, you have a lot more freedom uh, to just go, you know, essentially probe the hole uh, potential energy surface. And this is part of the reason that we see that uh, less mass asymmetry, meaning more, more mass symmetry in the fragments um, when there's a larger incident energy uh, introduced to the system. So just another pretty picture, um, you know, that we, we can generate with these, uh, these microscopic formalisms. So here just, you know, just a 1D idea of what this uh, two saddle potential energy surface looks like. You know, we start here in a ground state and we have to hop over this saddle, hop over this saddle, and eventually we get into this um, runaway dumbbell shape and, you know, it ruptures and breaks. And typically we think of, you know, we, we sort of follow the least action path to the potential surface, but it's quantum mechanics. There might be multiple paths that we can actually follow sort of multiple modes of scission. Um, and these can be, you know, highly symmetric, these can be asymmetric, these can be elongated, 
um, there's various descriptions that we can use to you know, sort of understand how this works. So one important thing I'd like to come up with a nice mental model to explain is the idea, I don't wanna to get too much into it because I'm sure Nathan will talk about it tomorrow, but the idea that there is a strong dependence on fragment mass of the number of neutrons that are emitted by that fragment, right? So once our fragments are separated, remember that they're, you know, they have all this in intrinsic excitation energy um, and they're, you know, they're zooming off. And what we see is that these neutrons that are emitted essentially are, are boiling off most of that excitation energy. So we can sort of think of this average number of neutrons as sort of related to how much excitation energy is available to a system. So we see this really interesting sawtooth-like behavior, right? Where the amount of excitation energy available to, uh, the frag uh, to a given fragment is strongly, strongly dependent on fragment mass. And there's this interesting sawtooth. So a nice mental model that might help us explain this is that we have, uh, before, right before scission, we form two uh, sort of spherical closed shell system. So here for California 252, um, we have tin 132 and uh, I forget what 78 is, maybe nickel or something. So someone can correct me if uh, whatever this is. Um, and so we form these two sort of closed shell, stable spherical uh, ends of our dumbbell. And then they share sort of this neck of nucleons, neutrons and protons between them, right? And uh, what happens, uh, is that this neck ruptures. And we can think of, so say it ruptures, you know, right here, and we get one really stable uh, nucleus with, you know, 78 nucleons. Um, that's going to be really stable, right? That's going to have uh, very little excitation energy and will boil off very, very few neutrons, right? It'll be way down here. And then this one will be, you know, it'll have like 150 or, you know, have like 160 something nucleons. It'll, it'll be really, really big, right? Because we split right here and all of these guys in the neck will end up with this guy and we'll have a lot of excitation energy will be highly deformed and then we'll boil off a lot of neutrons as a result. And we can think of vice versa. If we split here, right, we'll end up um, with one of our fragments around 132, um, very, very stable and spherical, not a lot of excitation energy. And the other one will be, you know, close to uh, 120, right? It'll be this, this guy plus all the nucleons in the neck and it'll boil off a lot of neutrons as a result because it'll have a lot of deformation, a lot of excitation energy. So that's sort of the mental model um, we think of. So, right, so just pointing um, where these sort of pre-fragment cores exist in the nuclear landscape, right at these shell closures. And um, right, because they're spherical, they carry very little deformation energy. And if you know you end up with one of these, meaning all the other nucleons in the neck go with the other guy, then you get one of your fragments being very stable, spherical, little dex, dex, or little deformation energy, and therefore boils off very few neutrons. So I guess a question then arises: Where does the neck rupture? You know, is it going to rupture over here? Is it going to rupture over here? Um, because this is going to determine the mass asymmetry. Of course, this is going to determine um, the neutron multiplicities as a function of fragment mass. This is gonna determine a lot of the things we observe uh, when it comes to uh, fission. And there are a variety of different models. I'm gonna end the talk just talking about a couple different models we have for where the snack ruptures. Uh, because this is actually an open question. This is not something we, uh, we have a, a solid answer to. So there's what's called the Brosa model, which is a macroscopic sort of liquid um, treatment, a, a nuclear liquid treatment that says the neck rupture is completely uniform and random. And this is an okay model. It describes the bulk properties um, of our, you know, of our, uh, you know, that we observe in fission pretty well. Um, but what else is out there? So a few years ago, there was a really big paper in Nature that uh, it was a really great experiment where they're able to measure the spins of indirectly measure the spins of individual fragment fission fragments. And by spins, I mean the intrinsic angular momentum, right, that they're produced with. And I think uh, in 
Nathan and I think uh, Ramona, uh, Dr. Vote in a, in a few days, will talk a little, uh, you know, quite a bit more about this angular momentum. Um, but the, the point I want to make here is that in this model, we sort of treat our, uh, our neck like an elastic band and say classically, it would rupture right in the middle at its weakest point, right? But the, you know, with quantum mechanics, there's, uh, you know, there's some uncertainty. And uh, in this paper, they propose that the neck rupture is random, but it's sort of uh, focused on the middle, right? It's sort of most likely to rupture right in the middle. But you know, again, it is, it is a random process. Um, and then another possibility is that uh, the location of the neck rupture um, is predetermined well before scission happens. Um, so it's determined due to complicated, you know, many body quantum mechanical effects long before scission happens. And, and this, our mental model is less like an elastic band, but more like, we're thinking more like a fluid that has surface tension. And if there's, you know, we create this sort of you know, as we're deforming into this weird dumbbell shape, if there's this little wrinkle right here in the middle where the neck is not quite fully filled, even at this stage, then that's going to be, um, you know, a, a fluid with surface tension is not gonna like that wrinkle. It doesn't want all that surface area. So the rupture, we can think of as sort of healing the wrinkle as, as um, you know, as creating more stable liquid drops essentially. So that is, uh, what another group that uses um, that this is a microscopic approach using density functional theory, this, this microscopic mean field theory I talked about. Um, and they say that the neck rupture is determined during the deformation by quantum effects that create a little wrinkle between our prefragments. Okay, so once we have these fragments, once the neck ruptures, you know, we have two independent fragments for the most part. Um, and I should mention that uh, maybe going back to this slide, right, we see a lot of messiness, right? So again, sort of maybe stretching this idea of uh, treating the, the nuclei like a, a liquid droplet that breaks, um, what you might have is little bits and tiny droplets uh, flying out as it tears apart, right? So you get two main fragments and what you might also see are neutrons or maybe light charged particles that are also produced during that scission process itself. Um, that is another interesting sort of open uh, area of research. But great, once this happens, we have our two fission fragments. They're now ruptured, they're independent, they're far away from each other, or they sort of accelerate away from each other because they're both uh, positively charged. Um, and then uh, as they accelerate away from each other, that deformation energy, so they're both highly deformed, highly excited, a deformation energy then equilibriates and sort of is shared statistically amongst the neutrons within each fragment. And then it, they do something to get rid of all this excitation energy and this angular momentum. And I'm not gonna spoil it, stay tuned tomorrow and Nathan will tell you what happens with all the energy that these fragments have. So I wanna just sort of end the talk and open it up to questions. And, and I wanna ask a couple interesting questions of my own that I think are, um, interesting avenues of research on fission. So I mentioned, right, that, um, you know, given this energy budget, right, the, the Q value, the energy liberated in fission, that has to go towards the total kinetic energy and total excitation energy of the two fragments. But how is this shared um, between the two fragments? How are kinetic energy and excitation energy shared between the two fragments? And we kind of touched on this, um, talking about deformation and how, you know, more deformed fragments are going to have more excitation energy and less kinetic energy. But can we sort of make this more rigorous? Can we build a, you know, a more uh, precise and quantitative model of this idea? Um, another interesting, uh, very, very interesting open question is, what mechanism drives that introduction of large angular momenta to the fission fragments? So especially for example, in say Californium 252, you start with, uh, you know, a ground state, um, uh, nucleus with, with no, uh, no angular momentum, and you end up with two fission fragments with a very large, each one having a very large angular momentum. And um, we can sort of kind of, you know, explain that in this elastic band sort of mental model where you break an elastic band and the two pieces want to sort of spin away from each other. Um, but that is, uh, that is an interesting open question. 
Um, can we pin down where and how this neck rupture occurs? And can we, you know, really quantitatively propagate this to fission observables? And can we understand the sensitivity of fission observables to, you know, where this neck rupture occurs? Again, something we kind of touched on, but it would be nice to be more quantitative. And of course, a lot of fission research is focused on, you know, the three big boys, uh, Californium-252, Uranium-235, and Plutonium-239. But, um, you know, there's a lot of other fissioning isotopes that are interesting to study. And, uh, and like I, you know, briefly mentioned without any explanation, um, fission also sort of shows up in nuclear astrophysical phenomena. So can we understand, um, you know, can, by understanding fission, can we learn more about, you know, the formation of stars and then the, you know, the R process and, and RP process and all these things that, um, you know, these astrophysical processes that create nuclei. So those are my questions. Um, if you have any questions, please unmute, put them in the chat, raise your hand. Um, and if I, we don't get to you, feel free to email me uh, questions as well. So with that, I'll turn it over. So Kyle, there are a couple questions in chat uh, about how this work relates to uh, applications of vision, specifically reactor design. So I'll, I'll read the questions. Yeah. Uh, how does nuclear deformation impact reactor design and performance? Can you please explain how fission fragments are characterized and detected experimentally? Additionally, what are the main challenges that arise when trying to accurately measure their properties? And then there's a, a follow-up that says, also in the context of nuclear waste management, what are the challenges associated with the long-term storage and disposal of fission fragments? Yeah, those are really, really great questions. So how does nuclear deformation uh, affect uh, the, the deformation of fission fragments affect uh, nuclear reactor design? Uh, not much, I don't think. Um, so, I mean, it, it, insofar as deformation is an important part of the process of the way fission uh, fragments share kinetic energy and excitation energy, and the kinetic energy of the fission fragments um, determines how much essentially heat, how much power that an individual fission reaction will produce within your reactor. And the excitation energy uh, determines how many neutrons will be produced in a single fission reaction. So in, in a sense, deformation is important in that uh, you kind of need this balance between kinetic energy produced by the, uh, or kinetic energy given to the fragments. So that way the, you know, the fission um, uh, reaction actually heats up your reactor and excitation energy given to the fragments so that the fission reaction produces more neutrons and then therefore you know, continues the chain reaction. So in a sense, I guess deformation is very important to having uh, the correct balance between these things. Um, I mean, it, it is I really like the deformation is, is kind of what drives this whole process, right? Um, I, I called my talk deformation to saddle decision to fragments and deformation is really what drives this whole thing. But yeah, in the context of a re reactor, right? You need kinetic energy to heat it up and you need excitation energy to boil off neutrons um, from the fragments. So, and the, I think the next question was about uh, measuring fragments, Nathan, could you repeat it? Nathan? Yes. Uh, the follow-up questions are, can you explain how fission fragments are characterized and detected experimentally? And what are the main challenges that arise when you try to measure their properties? And then there was also a question about waste management and how, uh, and the challenges associated with storing fission fragments. Yeah, so I mean, it's, those first two questions sound like great questions for Nathan, um, and maybe he can uh, follow up or get into more detail about them tomorrow, because Nathan uh, has built a detector for fission fragments and is doing experiments with it right now. Um, but the basic idea, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you can detect fission fragments essentially in a gas chamber. Um, and what you do is you have some gas, and you have your fissioning sample in the middle of this gas. And when these, you know, the charged, uh, you know, highly charged, very fast moving fission fragments move through this gas, they ionize the gas. And if you apply a voltage across your gas by putting wires in it, the ionization 
causes electrons to drift towards your, your positively charged wires and it causes the ions that you produce in the gas to drift towards your negatively charged wires and you collect the charge on those cathodes and anodes, those positively and negatively charged wires. And that tells you um, essentially, you know, what happened here, you know, what, uh, what time did a uh, fission fragment move through here? Um, how, how it kind of tells you how big it was, how fast it moved, things like that. So that's how you detect fission fragments. Um, and I think Nathan could probably talk in, in much more detail about that because, you know, again, he's built one and, and, and uses one. I'm just a humble theorist. I don't know how to, you know, how electricity works. Um, and then I think the next question was about um, uh, difficulties in detection of fragments. Is that what it was? Uh, yes, it was about how uh, challenges in trying to measure their properties. Uh, yeah. And there was also a question about uh, waste about management. Waste management, right. Yeah, so, um, you know, yes, fission fragments are, are hard to uh, measure for sure because, I mean, you have to under, really understand the response function of, of this gas chamber that you construct to be able to extract, you know, how much mass uh, did, this, uh, did this isotope have? Um, really, really difficult to reconstruct how much charge this isotope had. And you know, also quite difficult to reconstruct you know, what speed is it moving? What was its kinetic energy? Um, and there are ways people are getting around that. There are some modern detectors that um, essentially do time of flight on fission fragments. And they have, you know, like one, uh, like silicon or like, uh, I guess, you know, some sort of piece here and then some sort of piece here. And, the, and they only select fragments that go through both pieces and they can take a timestamp here and a timestamp here and they can understand exactly how fast these fragments are going. Um, and that you get a lot more information out of, but you know you only select fragments that go from here to here, right, in this exact path, and therefore um, your statistics are much lower. So these experiments essentially take a lot longer. Um, Nathan, do you have anything to add? I guess about difficulties in measuring fission fragments. Uh, I'll leave it at that for now. I think. Okay. You're gonna talk more about the well how to indirectly measure their properties tomorrow. Great, okay. And then in terms of uh, storing fission fragments, and I should say um, fission fragments are quite short-lived, right? When we say fission fragments, typically we're talking about these things that are highly energetic and are boiling off neutrons and gammas. Once that's done, we maybe more accurately could refer to these things as fission products. Right, these are the long-lived fragments after the the prompt neutrons um, and gammas are emitted, and these things are either stable or unstable to beta decay. So what? So they are primarily they're they're radioactive, right? They're unstable to beta decay, and after beta decay, they can undergo um, they can undergo uh, neutron emission, and um, and also subsequent gamma emission and things like that. So these long-lived fission products or these fission products are, you know, often quite radioactive. There are long-lived ones that are um, very important to find, you know, long-term storage for that is shielded. Um, and then there are short-lived ones that kind of burn off quite quick. Um, so typically what uh, the, the, typically how we treat spent fuel is when you pull a fuel assembly out of the reactor, you essentially leave it in water for like five years. Um, and that burns off a lot of the short-lived, the short-lived uh, radioactive isotopes will then decay. And then um, the, those are the really, really radioactive ones. And then you take it out of there and you stick it in a big concrete cask. And that's basically as far as we got, like that's, that's what we do. We stick them in a big concrete cask and we say, great, they're in there and it's stored and that's that's how we store spent fuel all right this next one's pretty straightforward i think uh is there a probability to get equal fission fragments and if yes when yes so yeah you can get equal mass uh fission fragments um it is fairly unlikely to get them for um for spontaneous fission of californium or induced fission 
by a thermal neutron on you know, some of these other isotopes. So essentially it's improbable to get symmetric fragments uh, when you have very little excitation energy available to play with in your target uh, nucleus. However, if you have a lot of excitation energy available to play with, um, for example, in, in uh, fission induced by a very fast neutron, then you're able to, so maybe going back to uh, this picture, you're able to uh, sort of traverse this potential energy surface um, with much more freedom if you have a lot of excitation energy because you're starting sort of up here instead of down here in this, in this uh, valley. Um, so in that case, you often have uh, symmetric fission uh, when there's a lot more excitation energy to play with. All right. Uh, someone is asking about accelerating uh, the decay of waste via bombarding with neutrons. Uh, could you uh, accelerate the decay chains of fission fragments by bombarding them with neutrons? And to that end, could fission fragments be recycled into control rods? Yeah, so uh, what you're describing essentially is a closed fuel cycle that happens in fast reactors. Um, so this is, um, yeah, this is essentially how, how fast or breeder reactors work, essentially where um, you take something like uranium-238, that is, uh, you know, it undergoes fast fission. Um, so it, it undergoes fission uh, with, with fast neutrons. Um, and 238 is, is uh, primarily, uh, you know, the, the primary isotope of uranium that's, you know, uh, naturally um, abundant. Um, however, if you're asking that, can you take, say, xenon-139, which is a, um, you know, a, one of the fragments that might you know, come off of uh, one of these isotopes when it splits and then keep hitting it with neutrons until it becomes uranium-235 again? No, you can't do that um, because, you I mean, you would, need, you would need to have such a, you would need to be like in the middle of a neutron star to have <laughs> that many neutrons, uh, to, you know, in such a short time to be able to do that without decaying. And uh, related to that, uh, if the participants want to take a look, uh, Dr. Ramona Vogt, who will give a presentation on Thursday, has been leaving some answers in the, the Q&A section as well. Uh, and one of these answers is about the R process. So uh, that could be of interest for, for that question as well. Uh, someone else is asking, would there be a general trend in fragment yield and deformation comparing spontaneous fission to induced fission, or both thermal and fast? Yeah, yeah. So uh, like I said, the for fast fission, um, typically you uh, will have less deformation energy um, and, uh, and you will become more, more symmetric. Um, with spontaneous fission, uh, I think spontaneous fission and, ther and, and thermal fission are quite similar uh, in that you will be highly asymmetric um, and typically highly asymmetric. And uh, the, the ratio of uh, excitation energy to kinetic energy will be you know, something like this, where you have roughly 25 MEV of excitation energy that goes into that deformation. And you know the rest of that roughly 200 will be in kinetic energy. Uh, next question is when the nucleus fissions, what determines the appearance of certain nuclei in the next generation? Uh, right, so that would be, uh, I mean, so there's, there's quite a different, there's quite a, a handful of ways we can explain that, right? So one of them, is this finite range droplet model where we have macroscopic sort of liquid effects plus shell and pairing effects that go towards uh, describing, you know, which nuclei are produced. Um, we can also look at, you know, in a mean field model where the, uh, the stretching along this axis, the, the Q30 uh, collective coordinate sort of determines 
the mass asymmetry of the split and and uh, which um, you know which isotopes essentially are produced. Um, so I guess to answer your question, complicated quantum mechanical effects. Um, so you can think of it on a bulk scale as a liquid droplet. But these 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 shell effects because uh, nuclei want to be in these you know the the fission fragments want to be close to these shell closures where they're stable um, correct this liquid drop idea and sort of add a correction um, that sort of drives the the shapes uh, or the yield curves that we observe and uh, speaking of quantum mechanical effects. Uh, this question says, uh, I wonder if the modulus of the rupture equation with respect to the Coulombic force being applied to the neck could help predict the rupture point. Yeah, that's interesting. So that's like, a, that would be a, uh, a very classical treatment of, um, of the rupture, right? And that, that would be an interesting, uh, that would be an interesting thread to pursue. It's like, how, how accurate can you be uh, with just treating this purely like the rupture, the dynamics of the rupture itself as a purely classical sort of liquid drop process. Um, and potentially you could come up with a phenomenological model there where, you know, you, you fit like a viscosity term in your liquid to, uh, you know, to observables or things like that. So yeah, it's a very interesting idea. And then uh, there's a clarification on an earlier question. Uh, regarding bombarding the, the nuclear waste, uh, they mean to ask about shortening nuclear waste lifespans to make long-term storage easier. Uh, there are yeah. illusions of turning fission products back into U-35, for example. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that is, uh, yeah, that is, uh, as far as I know, an active area of research. I believe there's people in our department doing that with uh, photon bombardment. Um, but yeah, I see no reason why you couldn't do that with neutron bombardment. I might be ignorant and that might be a thing people actually do. Um, but if not, I would be surprised if it's not an active area of research. It, it could be interesting. Uh, I think that you run the risk of uh, adding more energy and just shifting fission products into different decay chains uh, that may or may not help you, uh, which you know, very well could be an active area of research. Yeah, you probably don't want to use neutrons because the issue is these things are already too, too neutron rich, right? They kind of live out here um, and they want to go back here towards stability. In principle, you could hit them with uh, protons, but that would probably be way more expensive than it's worth. But, you know, if you hit them with protons, you would move something, you know, over here up, right, towards stability. Um, but yeah, I, I actually do know someone in our department or maybe a group in our department uh, in the materials uh, section is working on um, using photons. So photon accelerated sort of uh, inelastic reactions to de-excite um, or I guess accelerate the decay of these uh, long-lived fission products. All right, so with that, we're at time. Kyle, if you could go back to your slide with your email on it really quick yeah yep yeah. uh if anyone else has additional questions uh, please take this time to write down kyle's, kyle's email so that you can address them afterward uh and with that i think we're all all set so thanks everyone for coming uh, i'll see you all again tomorrow for uh what happens next after after the nuclear splits thanks guys thanks for listening <laughs>